very um, happy to welcome uh, one of our uh, one of our esteemed colleagues on campus. So we wouldn't be able to do what we do here in the research park if it wasn't for the many, many people on campus who assist our, our, ourselves as well as our clients and our community. And um, there's perhaps no, uh, no more partner like that than Engineering Career Services. And Lauren Stites, who's with us today is the Associate Director of Engineering Career Services. And we get to work with them very intentionally and fruitfully throughout the year, but more, perhaps more importantly and more um, germane to the conversation today is that engineering career services and career services community on campus is at the forefront of providing resources such as today's program to our community broadly. And they have expertise that goes well beyond uh, where is the career fair and how do I sign up? So we want you to understand that um, and of course, those things are very important, but I think what is most important is that we can help impart skills that you can take with you, um, you know, uh, for more than just uh, one event or a one-time thing. And that's what we're here to talk about today, which is networking. So I will turn it over to Lauren to get started. As we mentioned, uh, feel free to, to network in the chat. So thanks, Austin, for dropping your information here. But we look forward to hearing what Lauren has to say, and welcome back to the research part. And you're on mute. I know it. I'm like, thanks for the introduction. And I'm muted. Yay. Um, all right. So let me just look here what I'm doing. Okay. I'm hopeful that you all can see the slide that is just the one slide that says the intentional networking and not um, the slide that says next slide. I'm we pretty sure yep. that's the case. Okay. And I think... I'm able to manage also the chat, but of course, Laura or Kathy, if you see anything come through, please don't hesitate to be like, oh, there was a question and we can certainly talk through that. I have quite a few things to share with you today. Um, so I'll be moving through um, the slides relatively quickly, but I do wanna encourage anyone who's here, if you're interested in, if you're like, what was that one thing? I know I think Kathy mentioned this would be recorded today, so you can always jump back in on that, but also feel free to connect with me. Um, outside of this workshop and happy to talk through any questions you might have. Um, we're talking today about intentional networking. I think that even joining this event this afternoon is not only a great um, opportunity that Research Park provides for you for, for personal and professional development, but also does give you an opportunity to network. Um, and maybe the easiest way there is, as we have we are still offering things virtually. I agree with you, Laura. We've kind of gotten used to networking and virtually, and now we're starting to tiptoe our way back into in-person, and it'll be interesting to see how we all navigate that, who's really more comfortable in that setting, who wishes they were still able to, you know, be in that virtual setting at, at home or in their space, their own space. Um, but the intentional networking that, we that we're going to talk about today is um, we're going to be kind of focusing on the value of networking. We'll talk about some specific network strategies and then also how to network appropriately, kind of the do's and the don'ts. And we're focusing on networking because we're also going to be talking about how our networking can lead to great mentorship opportunities and building a mentor and how that works and how do you do that and, and, and just kind of talking through the process. You don't typically just go up to someone and say like, will you be my mentor? Um, and so again, I think networking allows us to have conversations with others and we'll talk again more about that. So these are kind of the three main goals I'm hoping that you walk away with today. But before we could begin with that, one thing I did also wanna make sure to mention is our career readiness, um, the career competencies. This is something that employers are looking for. It's my guess something you're building, um, whether or not you are aware of these you are. And so um, I'm curious in the chat if you, first of all, would be share with me a one if you are in an internship role or a two if you're in a full time role um, with Research Park. So, again, um, just really quickly, if you wouldn't mind sharing in the chat a one if you're someone who you're serving as an intern or two if you're in more of that full time role. All right. 
Great, so we've got a little bit of a variety. Um, looks like the interns are in the lead at the moment. And so with that, I want you, whether regardless of the number that you are, um, thinking about these roles and then thinking about, especially for my interns though, being intentional on, on either, how are, you, how are you building these types of skills? Because ultimately we'll talk about, um, you know, I'd love to have an, a conversation with you, whether if you're in engineering, come to me. If you're in another um, major to talk with your career services office about these skills and how to make sure that you are emphasizing them on your resume, like we're jumping forward and near the end of that opportunity, because these are things that these are skills you find on in job postings, it's things that employers value as they're looking for new hires. And certainly today when we're talking about networking, it's, it's hitting actually several of these. Um, when we're talking about networking, we're, that's building career and self-management um, because you have to have the awareness of your strengths and weaknesses perhaps as you're talking to others. Obviously we're building communication skills as we're, for some of us, maybe getting outside of the comfort zone to talk to others, um, the professionalism you're building as far as your personal brand. Your personal brand. Um, for some of us, the networking is technology as we continue to be in that virtual setting as well. And of course, to be thinking also in terms of just the work that you're doing in the role that you're currently in, what are the, with these eight skills, which ones do you identify with? And, and maybe some that you're like, oh, actually, I hadn't thought about professionalism, but yes, I am building that right now. All right, so why are we talking about networking? Why should you be investing in this? Um, I think that the three kind of bullet points here that we're sharing are some of the biggest reasons why. So first of all, 70% um, of our jobs are not advertised publicly. Um, companies typically receive six times the applications as people working in the company, and 40% of new hires were referred to their current job. As an intern, many employers do use their, uh, their interns as a pipeline to a full-time hire, so it's more than just showing up for the job on the daily, um, but also that you're using, you're being intentional in connecting with others as you're working with them, so that you become, you're not just another kind of applicant in the pool, but you start to, you know, the networking gives you the opportunity to be for a recruiter or for the person who you're talking to, to see a holistic view of who you are. And if a conversation goes really well, it's common that someone might say, you know, pass your resume along to me, or I'll keep you in mind if we end up look, you know, as we're looking for opportunities or as I hear of things. Um, networking is not, and we'll talk about these in a minute, um, so actually, I'm not going to tell you what networking is not. Instead, we'll just focus on the why invest in networking is it, it's, it can be fruitful. However, there are a lot of people who have concerns about networking. And the words on the screen here include uncomfortable, weird, confusing, inauthentic. Authentic is a big buzzword we hear about being authentic, your authentic self awkward, unsure, maybe anxiety is connected to networking. I'd be curious if you just give me a plus if you agree with any of those words when you yourself think about networking or a minus if you're thinking, I don't, I don't have those problems. So again, a plus in the chat if you're like, I can, I can identify with a word or two in there or maybe a minus if you're feeling pretty, you're like networking is my, is my strong game. Can't wait to network. All right, so yeah, I think that this is fair. Even as a professional who's been in career services specifically for over you know close to 15 years, even I can still feel uncomfortable or awkward in a, in a new networking environment. But the good news is that networking is a skill. And with networking, that if it's a skill, that means that we can learn it. And one of the ways that we get better at networking or improve our skill of networking is through practice. So how do you find networking opportunities? You know, for example, career fair. Career fair is a big networking opportunity. Career fair might also be, have a bigger impact in the network, right? I've got to kind of really have my game on. So what are maybe some ways that I can practice my networking and it not feel like it's as big of a, well, just as a risk, perhaps. 
not to say that career fairs are risky, um, but where you might feel that there's the, it's a, it's a heavier event. So certainly something like this, you've joined an event like this, Research Park has other opportunities coming throughout the summer, making it a priority, schedule the time in your calendar to join these types of events, say hello to people afterwards, connect with them on LinkedIn. I think Laura and um, I'm pretty sure Laura had already put in the chat her, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn. So that's one way that you could do that. And I'd encourage those of you that have LinkedIn profiles, if that's something that you feel comfortable sharing with the group to, to share that. And, and then that's one way that you can build that. Um, other things can be signing up for, of course, those handshake events. This is specific to my students who are at Illinois um, for handshake events, looking for information sessions or tech talks. Um, depending upon the additional types of events that Research Park has, and I know you guys do an amazing job of providing ways to connect, um, not just within teams, but across the community of Research Park, you know, paying attention to what's coming out on those newsletters, or if there are companies who are doing tech talks who think you might be interested, those can be nice informal ways to just practice going up and saying hello to someone if it's in person or to practice even in the chat, putting yourself out there and saying hello and who you are and, and who you're working with, what are you looking for? Those are some kind of easier ways perhaps to ease into the water of networking. Treat every event as a networking opportunity. So if you have a meeting with maybe some new team members, use that as an event to network. It's making sure that you're saying hello, getting their name as well. Virtually, this is easy. Virtually, everybody's got their name right now already in their little magic squares of Zoom. And so this is even something where if you're in a meeting and you may not have necessarily a large role in it, but you could still be taking, you could be jotting down the people's names who you then wanna look for and connect with later. And again, don't forget to talk to your friends and colleagues and mentors, and we'll get to how you can, who, who are those mentors. Um, but talking to your friends and colleagues, even the friends who perhaps are having different experiences this summer and hearing about what they're doing and talking with them can also be a way to continue to network. Now, guidelines for networking. Um, it's just a few of these are kind of relevant. So networking obviously requires time and energy to be successful. Where we can, it's in, it, ha, it needs to be intentional. I You have to bring the energy, right? Especially if we're kind of virtual, it's easy for me to turn my camera off. It's easy for me to kind of disengage. And there, there's caution there, I will say, if you're being intentional to participate in an event that's virtual, I, I challenge you to also be present for that. It's easy for, virtual events perhaps to kind of become background noise where we're like, oh, I'll just also quickly check my email while I'm listening in. And, and it just, it loses some, some power or impact there. Take initiative. So like I had said before, sign up for the events that are coming out. Say yes when you can. Your strategy should, should correspond to the setting, just meaning that sometimes it's going to be where you can actively be engaged and and be saying hello, or if there are breakout sessions, making sure that you're, you know, even the breakout rooms in Zoom, that you turn your camera on, that you say hello to the people, um, compared to if it's really more where I might be behind the scenes as, as speakers are talking, writing down their name, connecting with them later on LinkedIn. And we'll talk in a minute about some kind of tips on how to do that. Your parents should be professional. Um, and that when you're attending these types of events, I, that does not mean that you need to be in a business suit, but again, um, that you should be in, in that business casual attire and not maybe in that Illini t-shirt, unless of course that's appropriate for the event. And then be respectful and appreciative of people's times. This is really important as we move to kind of talking about informational interviews, having maybe a quick coffee chat with someone on your team and making sure that we are aware if we've asked them like, hey, can we connect for 15 minutes that we honor that 15 minute mark and that we don't kind of just plow through and just assume that they're still gonna be available for 30 minutes. All right, things to avoid. So I think some Sometimes these are helpful too. The, to, the do's are helpful. The don'ts are, are help, can also be helpful. Taking up too much of the conversational space. So while I challenge you to yes, use your voice and say the thing, you know, introduce yourself. Networking, it shouldn't necessarily be all about me. 
now granted, I am leading a presentation right now, so I'm the one speaking, but if we were doing kind of a true networking event, it should be a bit of a back and forth. We're asking questions. We're also um, taking time to actively listen. Actively listening means that we're truly listening to what the person is saying. We're not thinking about what's the next thing I'm going to say, but we're listening to what they have to say. We want to make sure, especially in, in person, like that you're, we don't want to be aggressively making an ask for a business card if it just doesn't seem like it's the right fit. Um, certainly in networking, this is something that I think we, networking is a longer play. A short play, easy button is like log on to Handshake, look for a job posting, hit apply. That's the easy button. Networking takes a little bit more work. Networking isn't necessarily where I'm saying, hi, I'm Lauren and I'm looking, are you guys hiring? That's not gonna be the lead in question that I start with. Instead, I'm gonna, this is an opportunity for me to gather information, perhaps using it more as an, explore, as an exploration event or opportunity where I can learn more about them. Um, networking also and specifically, and obviously if, let me preface that with, if we're career fair, we're all in, right? That's the whole reason we're at the event is to be looking for jobs. But if we're in a different type of event, it's not necessarily the place where we'd be saying, are you hiring? Talking badly about other companies is a big no-no as well. We do sometimes, it's, you know, if you've ever seen them, the old movie Bambi, um, there's a bunny rabbit who says, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it at all. And so just being cautious about talking badly about other companies or other teammates you, we would want to avoid. And again, like I mentioned, we wanna challenge you to be an active listener um, so that you can actually respond to what they're saying and continue the conversation. So something to avoid would be to not listen to the other person. Of course, then also thinking about your strategy. So this is something again, where thinking through, well, what are you trying to accomplish by networking? Is this a conversation? Is it a one-on-one -on -one conversation where I wanna learn more about what this person is doing and I think I might be interested in their, and kind of like a similar career path as to them? Is this something where I'm going into an event and I'm looking, I'm actively pursuing a full-time or an internship opportunity? Thinking through what's the best way for you to meet your networking goals? What do you need to do in order to meet those goals? So does that mean that I need to create and practice and then be ready to deliver my elevator pitch? Um, if I know that I'm going to probably be doing a lot of introductions, then do I have that? Am, am I confident in my pitch? Have I practiced it a few times? Um, is it simply that I need to get myself out there and I need to start attending events and I want people to see that at every research park professional development series, they start to notice that I'm always there. And so I become a familiar face and a familiar name. Is it that I, you know, what do I need to do in order to meet? And then also thinking through on, okay, so I went to the events I made, you know, I kind of was intentional about being there. Did I connect with those people? Did I then after the events reach out and connect? So those are some kind of strategies to be considering as you're developing, you know, as you're being intentional in your networking. But why, right? So informational interviews, we're gonna quickly go through this. Maybe you're like, why? I don't, I don't, I don't like these. Um, and these don't have informational interview, honestly, that's just the the formal title of what these are. You can call them a coffee chat. You could call them um, just a quick 15 minutes of getting to know you. This is really, a informational interviews are just a conversation. They tend to be one-on-one, -on -one, so that might be helpful, um, but it's it can be great because this informational interview is focused on you collecting information from someone else. This could be done, I would, this could be done through your team. Perhaps you have several team members who are within the company that you're working with this summer. You don't necessarily work with them one-to-one, -one, but you know that they're also part of the team and you want to get to know them. So you might email them and say, hey, you know, I'd love, do you have time in your day? This Is there time in your week this week where we could maybe meet for 15 minutes, grab a coffee? I'd love just to ask some questions about, about you, learn, learn about who you are a little bit more. It's an opportunity for you to learn, for you to network, for you to research. It's also an opportunity for you to share your story. So the catch on an in, the kind of important piece of an informational interview is if you are asking for these with a teammate, it could even be a different company who you're you've 
you've noticed as at Research Park that you also think would be great. Maybe you connect, it could be over lunch, it can be a quick coffee chat. Of course, they could potentially be in person if you're comfortable with that. It can still be virtual, like, you know, cheers, coffee chat, here we go. Um, you know, you can do that virtually as well. But this is something that can be a great return on investment because of the different things that you can, that that ROI of an informational interview. So let's talk about that. That return of investment, it's short, it's a short commitment. Excuse me while the lawnmower goes. It's a short commitment. So we've got, you know, 15 minutes, maybe 30. It doesn't have to be for a full hour. Um, it's low pressure. It's an opportunity for you to collect information. Your questions are tailored to your specific interests. So this is important because when you're the one asking for that meeting, you're also responsible to kind of run that meeting. That means you don't just show up and say like, oh, hey, how's it going? Um, but if you're truly trying to gather some information or connect with them, it's okay you know, to have that either screen up that has some questions on it that you want to ask, or you have a notebook with them written down and to, to ask those questions. How did you get your start? Or I've, you know, I looked on link, I connected with you on LinkedIn. It seems like your career path is one that I would really be interested actually in kind of emulating. Talk to me about how you got your start. How did you get to where you are? Those kinds of questions would be good. If they're, if you're set, you might even ask them, you know, what do you think is the, a really important skill for the role that you're in? Or, you know, even if you're talking to a teammate, you know, if I wanted to continue with this company, what are some imp important skills I need to build? So those are some questions that you can ask. And then you can also share your story there so that if they're saying you really need Python, you know, or I really need someone who's a strong communicator who can, you know, who's really works to finish on, on time or, dead, you know, works with deadlines, that you then have that opportunity because you're listening to say, that sounds great. I mean, I'm really trying to be intentional to, to continue to develop that skill this summer. Um, you know, you can work through that and talk with them. Of course, the informational interviews also allow you to continue to build your network. So continuing to build it so that you can always come back to them later as well. It helps you again, as they share their story, learn about what successful people did to be successful and helps maybe even you learn about specific roles within an industry that you, without having to necessarily invest time in those roles, because you're hearing from someone who's in it based on their story that they share, you might be like, yes, that sounds exactly like something I'd love to do. Or it might be an opportunity where you're thinking, no, that is not actually what I thought it was. And I don't think that's what I wanna do. So it can help with that exploration of career. Requesting an informational interview um, can be pretty simple simply just introducing yourself and how you might be connected first of all. So even for example, if you were like, let's just pretend you decide, I, you know, what Lauren was doing seems cool. I, I would like to do that, but I don't know how to get myself into career services. Maybe you reach out and you're saying, hey, Lauren, it was great hearing from you at the Research Park Professional Development Workshop Series. I'd like to learn more about how you got involved in career services. Could we set up a time of, do you have 15, 15 minutes where we could just talk? about what you do and, and how you got in it. So that kind of lets them know, okay, who are you if I know you it, and, and how we're connected, lets me know that simply I'm interested in learning more about you. And then that short time frame to help you talk about their job or their career path. Again, the focus of that informational interview is to be focused on them, not necessarily focused on you. Sample questions you can ask during that informational interview or conversation can be like some of the ones that we have on the screen. They include, what do you like about this position? What are you working on currently? So again, you might be talking to another company in Research Park or perhaps a colleague who isn't working on the same project as you, but you're hearing what they're doing and it sounds interesting and you wanna learn more. Asking them like, what's the work culture like at your office? What's one thing you wish you would have known before taking the job? What previous experiences prepared you to be successful in your role? If you could change anything about your position, what would it be? And what factors did you evaluate before you accepted the job? That can be a really important question as you maybe get closer to um, 
considering if there is a full-time offer coming and they those people can be a great um, sounding board as you're thinking through and evaluating your offers. Now, all of those questions can kind of lead us to the, are you my mentor um, question? And this goes back to whether that not all informational interviews are going to land you here or, or it might land you there, but some people who you work with or who you have these conversations with, you're going to just feel like there's this natural connection. Um, you Maybe you really like them and you just feel like they're doing amazing work. They're doing what you want to do. Um, they not only told themselves about, about them, they not only told you their story, but they were asking you about yours. Um, there's gonna be some people who you just connect with and they could potentially be your mentor. Now, typically, the funny thing about, you know, so I tell students with career readiness, like we talked about in the beginning, the first rule about career readiness is we don't really say we're, it's career readiness. We don't say like, I am career ready. We wouldn't say that to an employer. That, that wouldn't really make sense. But, and the same thing in a way about a mentor, we wouldn't necessarily be like asking, will you be my mentor? The relationship can kind of, will can kind of naturally develop through multiple conversations. And these are some things to think about as you're looking or thinking about who do I want to continue to connect with. Some informational interviews or those conversations, those quick coffee chats, all can be valuable. Some are going to be a one time, maybe 15 minute conversation. And I'm going to sit, still find value in it but I may not necessarily feel like I want to connect with them again. A great mentor can be someone who, for example, maybe I am feeling like my thoughts are all jumbled. I don't know what to do. And your mentor helps you kind of wind them up um, in a nice, neat way, right? A mentor is also someone who is more than just the person who makes you feel really good or who you're thinking, oh, I think that I want to be, I want to do exactly what they're doing. Those can be good people, but the mentoring relationship has more pieces. It might be someone who you feel like, I know I can go to them when I'm, it's, it can be someone who's unbiased, who I can go to, and I, they might give me advice. They might, again, encourage me to be like, you, you know, encourage you through a per specific project, perhaps, that you're working on. They might help you as you're trying to figure out what's next. So what's the next thing that I want to do? Helping you in your direction. Um, and so those are, they're providing you some support. It is a relationship that also is not necessarily one-sided. This is something that you are both being intentional about connecting and that you're, um, that you're able to, that you're kind, that you're consistent with your meeting doesn't mean that you're meeting weekly. It might be something where you're meeting once a semester. Right now, a mentor for you might look like an academic advisor or a um, if you're doing research, maybe it's the professor you're doing research under, a grad student, someone who's maybe a few steps, the grad student who's maybe a few steps ahead and remembers what it was like and is guiding you maybe even with certain courses to take. So your mentoring relationships might also be things that continue to change over the years. Um, but being intentional and surrounding yourself with people who can kind of impact those pieces that are around that bubble um, is, is really important. And not only as a, and maybe you feel like you have that in your personal life, but it's also important that you have that in your professional career. Now, where do I find these? Perhaps we've talked about a few places. Certainly, Research Park is one. Perhaps the company that you're working with right now could be a place where you can start to build those networking, start to practice the networking experience, start to build some relationships. You might even find through that that there's someone who you think would be great um, to kind of serve in that mentor role. Um, but there are several other places I want to make sure that I mention. Certainly Granger Engineering Link for any of my engineering students. This is a great resource. 
for you to um, connect to. This is where alumni are there and they're expecting to have students reach out to them, to have conversations with them, to connect, and to potentially build that mentorship relationship. So I'm happy to talk more about Granger Engineering Link with those um, outside of the presentation later if you have questions, but that's a great resource. Of course, LinkedIn is a great tool too. Um, and so making sure that before you just start throwing out um, and trying to connect with people that you think about your profile, making sure that you have a professional profile picture. It doesn't mean you have to be in a business suit again, but that it's a picture of just you. So not a group shot with you and your friends, um, that you have an updated your about section. So someone can quickly see who you are, make sure that your experiences and projects are explained, that you've listed your skills and endorsements, that those are built out. I strongly recommend for you to be following companies you're interested in. I think this is sometimes as I do LinkedIn reviews with students, it's a missed pocket on, link, on their profile, meaning that as you follow companies, your feed on LinkedIn starts to change. If you're going to see more of those companies that you're following. And honestly, they can also select, recruiters can select a box that says like, I'm looking for a software engineer and I wanna see those people who are already following our company. So that can be an advantage for you. And then of course, double check your profile visibility settings. We often are like, you know, from career services, everything should be um, private, but LinkedIn of course should be something that's public. There's different ways that you can promote yourself on LinkedIn as far as the available for work button. Um, there's also, I'm trying to think if there's anything else off the top of my head, I was gonna mention, I feel like there was one more, but it went away. So certainly the available for work. And then again, making sure that your skills are updated as well. Another thing, as far as, as your messaging for LinkedIn, um, just keeping in mind that ideally many people, if you haven't heard this before, let me be the one to say it, make sure that you do more than just click connect. It doesn't require you to make a statement, but I think that your yield of people who accept those requests increase when we send a quick message. So for example, if you were to connect with me today and you reached out, you might say in the message, it was great hearing from you at the research park workshop this afternoon. I'd like to connect as well. And so then when I see that there's been an invitation, while I may not necessarily know you, I now have a point of reference for how you know me, and I'm much more likely to click yes and to connect. Let them know you're a student. Let them know why you're contacting them. Again, this is not a place where we're saying, hey, I'm looking for an internship. I'm looking for an internship for next summer, so I wanted to connect with you. Um, that again, we're not directly asking them for a job. We're connecting with them and maybe then building that relationship. And then you can also give them a question to respond if, um, I think this is more likely when we have connected with them, like the follow-up from an event. So again, I'm using the reference of career fair a lot, but it might be that you say, you know, I did, I applied online as you had recommended, and I'm curious if there are any additional next steps I need to take. And then that might prompt a response. So just something that would be an option. An example message on LinkedIn. Here's one where we have, again, their name. My name's Amy Spencer. I'm a sophomore studying computer science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So I've told them who I am, quick of, of where I am as well. I'm interested in learning more about the integration of artificial intelligence in the healthcare industry. I saw your profile on LinkedIn and I was wondering if it'd be possible to schedule a 15 to 30 minute phone conversation to learn more about your work. So here we've kind of ended with a question. It's short and concise. We let them know exactly what we need. And this is something, especially if you're looking on LinkedIn and you're finding alumni, this could potentially be a place where this is probably more of a cold, a cold market or a cold lead where I, I haven't connected them about where I've met them, but I have found them on LinkedIn and I want to learn more. Both strategies can work. You, if you aren't yet connected with the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign on LinkedIn, I would definitely recommend that that's one of your connections. You can click on the link that talks about alumni 
And then you can see where do they live? Where do they work? What do they do? Um, this then allows you also to keep kind of filtering down and allows you to start to see a, a smaller, it went, you know, 275,000 is a, is a bit to go through, right? So using those filters to shrink that number and maybe find someone who you're, you're looking for. With that also, I will say that again, for my engineers on this, who's, who are listening, that's another advocate why I would advocate for Granger Engineering Link or GEL as we call it, because LinkedIn is great. You can use this tool. It's, it's an amazing, LinkedIn is an amazing tool, but LinkedIn is a bit, sometimes can be a little bit of a colder market compared to gel where they have been intentional of connecting with alumni and those alumni are expecting you to reach out to them. So what I often tell students who are targeting alumni who are trying to connect and build those connections on link on really any platform we only have control of what we send out yeah that's your effort you control your effort you control how you're trying to connect we can't control if they respond a no response isn't a negative it might simply be that that person isn't actively engaged on linkedin it might be that they're swamped and they don't have time for 15 minutes and they didn't respond. So don't, if you, oh, if you send five connections and you feel like I didn't get anything, don't, don't be discouraged that that strategy doesn't work. I would, I would say in some ways this can be a numbers game. And certainly if we can target our networking and building those connections that could ultimately lead to mentorship opportunities, if we can target those smaller, smaller pockets, like events like this, like um, career fairs where we're connecting with individuals, I think that those can yield a better result as well. Of course, as we talk about connecting, it would I would be remiss if I didn't mention connecting with ECS. We have a variety of different ways that you can connect with us. Um, I'd welcome you to do so that you so that you can continue to stay um, connected with our office as we continue to bring programming both um, near the end of and on the beginning of August, we'll start ramping up with specific programmings. Um, and then also, of course, fall career fair is will be quickly approaching in September. And with that, also knowing that you can also connect with us throughout the summer as our office is open as well. Of course, I want to be um, sensitive to your time. I appreciate you guys sticking with me and listening. I hope that you found some valuable information throughout this presentation. Um, and so I wanted to leave the last few minutes open if there were any questions. Quiet group today. Quiet group. There was a lot. There was a lot of information <laughs> too. So waves upon waves, maybe you're, maybe you're drowning. I hope that's not the case. Um, and that's okay if there aren't. Again, I'll open up the invitation that even if afterwards, if you feel like, well, what was that thing she said again? Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'll give you my email. Um, I'm happy to, for you, again, for you to, to reach out if, if you have questions that pop up afterwards. I see a raised hand, Ethan. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could talk more about camera on and off etiquette, because I think it's tricky sometimes, especially when they're giving a presentation or if you're asking a question. Sure. Well, I appreciate that you turned your camera on, or maybe you just popped up into my, into my screen now that you had your um, hand raised. But what I will say to that is in some ways you can follow, if it's a one-on-one, -on -one, you can, you might even just follow the person who you're requesting is lead. Um, personally, for me, I prefer to see a face like a person when I'm presenting. One of the things that, and so I would say if it's a networking event, I would, I would encourage you if you have the ability to turn your camera on to do so. Again, that's one way where it shows that you're engaged in the event, you're paying attention, 
from a speaker perspective, it lets me see that like people, again, are engaged um, and helps with, in some ways, just the perhaps like energy in the, in the Zoom, if we will. Um, I, I don't think that it always has to be turned on. If there's things happening that actually you think would be distracting, for example, I have four children. They're home. <laughs> They're young. And so there are times where I might be on a meeting and if someone is coming in, I'm going to turn off my camera because otherwise that could be distracting to whoever's presenting. Um, so I don't think that it always has to be on. Sometimes I I think that, I don't know if it's true, but like if I'm having technical difficulties with just communicate, you know, with network, um, and I feel like, well, if I turn my camera off, that's going to help with the stability of my network. I don't know if that's true. Maybe you guys know that or not, but I feel like people are always like, oh, you should turn your camera off. That will help. Um, then that might even be something where you could even mention that like in the chat. Um, so those are, I don't, so I don't think that there's necessarily a steadfast rule for camera etiquette. That being with that though, I think, for example, if you set up a conversation with someone for a one-on-one, -on -one, if I ask Laura, hey, Laura, would you be willing to connect for 15 minutes? And she gets on, we're on Zoom and her camera's on, it would be appropriate for me to then turn mine on. Now, if her camera's off and mine's on and I notice that she doesn't have hers on, it would be, I would think it would be fine for you to then follow suit and turn yours off. And it might even be that you ask. If you know, because some will, I think everyone maybe feels differently. Some people feel more comfortable, you know, behind the scene. I think that it's nice if you have your camera off that you have a picture of yourself, like I see several of you having. So that could be something instead of just a name, it kind of helps still kind of fill the room with faces. So that might be some, I hope, I hope that's helpful and not more confusing. Uh, yeah, that was really comprehensive. Thank you. I Looks saw like, a question in the chat. Yep. So the question is, after building up a connection, whether through Gel or LinkedIn, when do you think it's appropriate to ask about opportunities at their relative company? So I think that that can potentially be a question that you ask as one of your questions. Um, even at the first time to say, you know, I'm wanting to learn more about your story. It might require that you do a little bit of upfront up research before you connect with them, where one of your questions might be, I noticed on your website, you know, thank you for sharing your story. I noticed on the website, there actually isn't any opportunity right now. Could you, do you know, like, where's the best way for me to connect with your company to learn about opportunities? So they might be able to give you some tools or tips on like, oh, you need to make sure you follow us on, on LinkedIn because they post them all the time there. Or really, you just need to keep coming back to our website. Or they might say, um, sometimes I have students who will say, you know, this has been really helpful as I continue to try to get into the field or into the industry. Would you be willing to take a look at my resume to see if, if you notice that there's anything missing? You know, are there certain skills that I really need to have that I don't have so that I can continue to be intentional on building them? So starting so that can be another way where you can where you can ask about about those opportunities or help them that they can give you some suggestions or advice towards it. All right. Well, I think that at this point we will wrap this up. Um, thank you so much, Lauren, for all this great information. If you did miss it or had to step away, or as we know, are maybe dealing with other people or creatures in your household um, and want to go back and look at this, we will have it up on our website um, in, or not on our website, on our YouTube channel in short order. So uh, thank you so much to everyone for participating today. And of course, thank you to Lauren for being part of our professional development series here at Research Park. Have a great day, everyone.